and the fruit, which is what we're studying now, love, peace, joy, long-suffering, it helps us to display God's character and God's nature. So, let's continue with our discussion by looking at the fruit of love, which is our topic for tonight, the fruit of love. The fruit of love, um, which is the first character or the first aspect of God's nature that Paul has put on the list in Galatians chapter 5, and we are down there at verse number um, 22. And for the sake of it, we're going to just read it, um, just read it in your hearing, Galatians chapter 5. Um, you should know where to find Galatians by now. Um, all right, Galatians is... Yeah, that book right there. All right. Here's what the Apostle Paul said, Galatians chapter 5. There's a lot in Galatians chapter 5, but we're down at verse number 22. And um, uh, let's read down to verse number 23. Here's what he said. But the fruit of the Spirit, the first one he surfaces is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. That's powerful. There are nine um, characters or natures or that, that form the nature of God, nine attributes, I want to say, that connect with the nature of God that the Apostle Paul surfaces in this text. Now, I want you to know that as we talk about fruit of the Spirit in, in reference to um, the nature, the character of God, um, these nine that's here in this text aren't the only ones. There's some other ones I'm going to show you in, in um, I think, Second Peter. There's some other ones, some other places. As a matter of fact, I think in total, based on what I've seen, there are little over 70 of them. There's only, there's only nine that the Apostle Paul writes about here, but there's literally, when you study the Bible and you go through the text, there's literally over 70 um, aspects of God's divine nature that we see. And this is what Paul is saying, that Holy Spirit in us is designed to cause us to exhibit these natures and characters of our Father. So we're just looking at these nine, but these aren't the only ones. I just wanted you to know that. So if you ask, Many people, what is love? You get many different responses. Um, you get everything from people being confused to um, them being ignorant. You get some people get angry when you talk about love. Um, some people, they can only talk about a good feeling about someone. You know, in 1984, the award-winning um, Grammy singer, Tina Turner wrote a song, and those of you that's um, lived um, long enough, you know the song. Tina wrote this song, and she says, what's love got to do with it? Um, what's love but a second-hand emotion? What's love got to do with it? She said, who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? Ha. The thing about it is, sadly, and I see some of you taking notes, sadly, many people, even in the church today have these same ungodly ideas about love. And that's why I'm going to tell you that we cannot and we must not follow popular culture or even influential people because without God, mankind has no idea what love truly is. Say, and we've got to know that and we've got to understand that. Grab your Bibles. Let's go to the book of John chapter 3. Um, because the summation of love is found in perhaps the simplest and yet the greatest text in the Bible. You know this text by heart. I want you to open your text because I want you to read along as Holy Spirit inspires you in this session as we talk about the fruit of love. John 3, I'm down at verse number 16. You know it? Verse 16 and verse 17. Um, John wrote and he said, For God, let's read it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17 said, so God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but he sent his son so that the world through his son 
might be saved. Now, that's the simplest and one of the greatest pieces of scripture concerning God's love that we will read in our duration of reading this text. So the very first thing that we notice about love is that love acts. Okay, love is not passive. Love gets stirred into action. Love acts. Love does. Love gets stirred into action and love gets stirred into, the act, into action for the sake of others. Think about that for a moment. It says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It didn't say God so loved himself. Okay? It said he so loved the world. So love got stirred into action for the sake of others. And we've got to understand that about God's love. So love takes the initiative to build up. It takes the initiative to build people up. It takes the initiative to help to meet the needs of others. And it does so without expecting anything in return. This is a classic example of love. God never asks us to do anything that we don't have the ability to do. Because the Bible declares that through Christ we can do all things because he strengthens us. The power of the Holy Spirit, and this is why the fruit of the Spirit is, is connected and it is produced in the life of the believer by the Holy Spirit. So we understand that the power to love, the power of joy and peace and long-suffering is already inside you and is being produced and developed in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. That whatever flows in Jesus as the vine should flow in you as the branch. All right, Romans chapter 5. Slide down to verse number 5. Um, here's what the apostle Paul wrote. He said, and he's talking about a number of things, but he says this. He says, and hope make it not a shame. But here's the latter part. He says, you, you don't have to be ashamed. Let's read it. One, two, three, go. Why? Because the love of God is shared abroad in your hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So, the reason why Jesus could demand for us to love is because he knows that we have received love already. Every born again believer that has um, given their life to Christ, that has the Holy Spirit living on the inside of him, has already received the love of God and has the love of God shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Ghost. Okay, the word shed abroad in the Greek means, it means to pour out. Um, the Holy Spirit has poured out the love of God in your spirit. Um, it means to spill over. It means to distribute largely. It means to have an overflow. So you already have the love of God in your spirit. It's already inside you. And I know it's there, not because I think it, but because the word says that the Holy Ghost sheds or pours it out. He spills it over. He distributes it largely. He overflows it in your spirit. So Jesus could demand of me and you to love because love is already inside of us. So that means that in our spirit, in your spirit, that you already have an overflowing abundance of God's love residing. It's just a matter of you choosing to honor God with your life and allow the Holy Spirit to pour God's love through you to touch others around you. 